Hey, what's up everybody? Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and it's episode number 248 of Goulet Q&A. As I'm recording this, it's officially the first day of spring. It'll publish two days later, but that's okay. It's warming up a little bit where we are, but it's still kind of cold. It's at that point where you're like, you're ready for it to be spring, but it's not quite spring yet. You know what I mean? Anyway, um, I have been doing a little more woodworking in my spare time recently. Um, it's been fun. I have not done much of it in the last, ooh, 10 years, basically, um, because, you know, kids, business, all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's interesting. I'm, I've just felt compelled really this year. If you remember uh, from right now, like right at the beginning of the year, I had kind of a New Year's resolution to, you know, figure out more what I wanted to do with woodworking and actually do something about it. And, I've kind of been doing that. So it's been fun. If you've been following me on Instagram, I've been messing around with some of that kind of stuff. Um, it's been good. But today I'm going to talk to you about 3D printed pens. I'm going to talk about what makes pens heirloom quality and then clipless pens too. So hopefully that'll be good. Be a nice, nice, you know, even keel Q&A for you today, I think. Um, do have some new stuff that we've launched. So I have some pens to show you if that's okay. A little bit of ink. Um, so we've had the Lamy Crystal inks, which we've been waiting for for months. We now have them. We had samples before, and now we have bottles too. So you can check out all of those. They're 30 mil bottles. They're kind of a premium line of ink, so that's uh, it's a different bottle than what you would expect in Lamy's regular ink line. Their regular bottle is a 50 mil bottle and looks very different than this. So this is a very presentable ink. Not that their other one isn't normally presentable, I think. Hang on, I got it right here. Um, this is their normal bottle, and it's normally got this like you know, paper in the bottom so you can wipe your nib and stuff like that. And it's got this kind of weird flat, you know, kind of look to it. Um, so this one kind of complimentary, but a very different style. So clearly different bottling, different, you know, capping and all that kind of stuff. Pr the packaging, the presentation is really nice. Um, and then the ink colors are nice and saturated. Um, I'm a big fan of the ink colors more so than most of their regular line. The turquoise, Lummi turquoise is good um, in their regular line, but most of the other ones are kind of like, you know, pretty bland. These ones are a little more punchy, and so I, I kind of like that. Um, they do cost a little bit more, but um, I found them to more or less be worth it, in my opinion, for the level of saturation, the nice colors that you get. Um, for me, Amazonite is kind of the standout, um, but Barrel is really nice. Um, or sorry, no, Azurite. Azurite is my favorite. Amazonite's really good, close second. Barrel is really nice too. Obsidian, they're all really good. Um, so I've been a fan of the Lamy. So we have those now, uh, and we should be getting more in case we run out. We got another shipment that's kind of on the way. Hopefully we'll see more regular stock of those coming in now. Um, we have the revival of the Monographa Game of Thrones pen. We had this pen a while ago. The show missed a season, so, you know, interest kind of waned, so we dropped them. Now it's in its final season, so we kind of picked them back up. I don't watch the show. I know it's somewhat controversial. You know, I don't condone most of the activity that goes on from the characters on the show. But if you happen to be into it, you know, it's a fantastic collector's item. Still nib. It's $280. Not cheap, but the theming is pretty on point. The pens look pretty darn cool. This is a Stark pen, in case you happen to know. Winter is coming. Even though I don't watch the show, I know enough of these terms. Um, pretty cool design. It's got an engraving. I'll try to show you this, but it's got, you know, engraving on the nib and everything. Boom. So it's got a nice engraving on the nib. Kind of matches the finial a little bit. You know, for each, each house, you know, each family, whatever you want to call it. I think they're called houses. Uh, that matches the theming of the pen. And this go around, which we did not have before, we have mugs to go along with it. Um, which I'll show you. I haven't actually seen this one for myself in person, so we'll go on this journey together. This is the Stark mug. Packed nice and snugly. There we go. Boom. Winter is coming. Stark. Game of Thrones. Pretty rad. Like, this is a pretty cool mug. So if you're into the show, it's like all official. It's got the HBO stuff all over it, so it's officially licensed. Pretty nice if you're into the show. Um, these are worth a look. We will not have them forever. Uh, we bought enough to kind of last the season and then we'll probably be out. Um, what else we got? Kaweco came out with some new frosted sports. So these things are kind of fun, kind of funky. They're um, slightly translucent here. Um, very kind of pastel, which I guess the pastel thing is really big right now. Uh, not necessarily my personal style, so I'm not like pining for any of these, if I got to be honest. But I know that this is in for a lot of you. Um, so the color selection that we have here, light blueberry, natural coconut, uh, lime, whoops, had a matter of water, lime, blush, pitaya, sweet banana, and then soft 
mandarin. Okay, not a soft nib, just a, the color is soft mandarin. So they're slightly, slightly translucent. Um, steel nib, you know, kind of the same as the regular Kaweco classic sport, um, you know, all silver trim colored, silver nib color. Uh, stainless steel, nibs made by Yovo, I believe. And um, they're $25 except for the extra fine nib, which is $27. A little bit of a premium on the extra fine, but the fine and medium are $25. And then along the Kuego line as well, the Perkeo, slightly longer pen, um, is come up with a new color called All Black. And the trim is black, you know, it's all blacked out. And the finial, the nib, everything completely blacked out. So that's pretty cool. Tend to like kind of matte black. And it's, and it's really kind of a matte black. It's not like a, a bright shiny black like the, you know, the Lamy Safari black is. Um, it's more like the Safari All Black, <laughs> which was the more the matte version. Um, that one is gonna be $17. And the nice thing about the Perkeo is it takes a standard international converter, whereas the normal ones do not. You have to use, you can use the Cueco little mini converter, um, but you gotta buy all those converters separately. Uh, and then we also have a new announcement of a pen that we've developed, the new Spring Premier from Edison, and it is called Trunk Bay. And I'll show it to you a little bit. This is my personal pen. This one is, uh, you know, we, we always try to pick ones that are maybe representative, but not super, super on the drastic end of things. This is, um, it's kind of a quartz-like, um, you know, look here. Uh, and it's got uh, blue almost to a turquoise, and then it goes kind of green here in the middle. Um, so there's variation kind of between blue, green, turquoise. Uh, and it just really, Rachel and I, we visited Trunk Bay with her parents like 10 years ago. Um, so Trunk Bay is a bay <laughs> uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, on the island of St. John. So uh, it's, it's a very famous kind of bay. You'll just Google Trunk Bay. You'll see all kinds of pictures of it and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so we went and saw it there. As soon as we saw this material, we were like, oh my gosh, that reminds us of that. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's that one. 169 for this one. It's a seasonal edition, so we'll only have it for three months. Uh, stainless steel nib made by Yovo. Extra fine through uh, 1.1, I think. And then I can't remember if we're still offering the 1.5 or not. I should probably check on that. But uh, anyway, great pens. If you're into the Premier, we've done many, many, many of them. And this is the next one in the line. So you can check it out. And then things that we're going to have soon, but I don't have yet to show you is the Pilot Iroshizuku 100th anniversary. We're gonna have the Seven Gods individual pens. And then we're gonna have the ink as well, which is now available separate from the big set. So um, that's pretty cool. We've been waiting this. We knew about this months ago. Now it's finally coming, we think next week. Um, so be on the lookout for those if you are interested. And we are going to offer um, all of the pens uh, together in a matching number. If you are interested in the entire set of all seven pens, then we will have uh, all of the same number for you if you are uh, wanting to collect. Uh, and then we have the Pilot Custom 74, Teal and Merlot. Of course, Pilot Custom 74 is one of my favorite pens of all time. Uh, and these two colors are on point. Like, they look really good. I don't have them to show you right now, but trust me, they're really good. And they're coming. Uh, and then Lamy Safari Pastels. So normally what happens is we have the All Star that comes out each year a little bit earlier, like in February. Uh, and then we have the safaris that come later in April. This year, we have kind of both of them woo, converging a little bit into March. So they're both pretty tight against each other. It's not really a problem, um, but uh, you know, it is kind of like we just had the bronze. Now we have the safaris, boom, bing, bang, bong. There we go. So um, we have three different pastels. I don't have them to show you still, <coughs> but once I get them in, I'll show you. Um, <laughs> essentially, the colors look a lot like this. <laughs> you know, it just so happens that Kuwaiko and Lamy came out with pastels that are very, very similar to each other. I don't think they'll be translucent at all. They'll be completely opaque. Not like the Kuwaikos uh, are slightly translucent, but there you go. So that's the new stuff that's coming. I think I mentioned everything. I don't know. I may have missed a couple things here and there. I was traveling before and now I'm back and here we are. Uh, all right, let's get into the questions for this week, shall we? So starting out with pen and writing questions, this is from Abby Knits on Instagram. Has anyone tried 3D printing a fountain pen? Uh, yes, 
there are not many people that, I, that I'm aware of. There may be some companies that are using 3D printing in their prototyping process um, and not necessarily 3D printing a final kind of version of the pen. Uh, the only company that I know that is doing a 3D printed pen is Additive Pens. Um, that's the one that I know, and they're kind of like, you know, marketing forward with that um, as being a 3D printed pen, at least on the, the barrel portion of it, um, I know is. Um, it's like got this kind of double helix looking thing. I don't have one here to show you. We have a member of our team that has one, and it's not in the building, so I can't show it to you today. Uh, but hopefully you can find a picture in overlay or something like that. But either way, just Google Additive Pens. Um, you can check it out. It's really kind of cool. They have like, it's their eyedropper pens, but because they're 3D printed, they, they 3D print it kind of vertically. Um, they're able to do some really interesting kind of helical patterns inside the pen. Uh, that's really kind of cool. That one I know for sure is 3D printed. Um, the only one that I know that has 3D printing kind of involved in the process, um, this is a pen that Rachel got in uh, DC last year. Um, and this is a pen made by Yoshi Nakama. Um, and he is pen.18111.com. Uh, very, very catchy name, I know. Uh, I had to look it up, honestly. I was like, I know there's a bunch of ones in it. Uh, but anyway, so Yoshi is super experienced artist. Um, started making pens a few years ago. You know, only sells them direct. So, you know, believe me, I asked him. I was like, hey, if I could ever sell your pens. But he only sells them direct. And that's totally cool. So I have no affiliation uh, other than I'm a fan and Rachel has his pens. But he, I believe, is using 3D printing as part of his process for making his Pen, pen rolls here, or roll stops. Um, and so you can see this is obviously a pretty elaborate thing. So I think he uses a combination of 3D printing and casting and stuff like that. Um, I don't know exactly how his process works, but I've heard that he is using part of that there. Um, so that is pretty rad because he's able to do these incredibly elaborate roll stops. Looks really cool. Rachel's a big fan of cherry blossoms. So when we saw this, it was kind of like, yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, uh, it's possible that there are other companies out there using 3D printing that I'm not aware of. These are the two that really kind of came to mind. Um, but I thought it was an interesting question and I wanted to talk about it a little bit just because I'm actually kind of surprised that 3D printing hasn't been a technology that has really worked its way more into the fountain pen world because you think pens are small, you'd think they'd be pretty easy, pretty fast to print up. Um, but I really haven't seen a lot of that. I haven't gotten the bug myself to get a 3D printer and try it out and try messing around with pens and stuff like that, mainly because time. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting. So I, I would love to know if you've seen anybody or if you have any curiosity or if you have a 3D printer yourself, you tried 3D printing it. Um, you know, it's kind of, kind of cool uh, to think about the potential of that. Of course, when 3D printer, printers first came out, it was kind of like, these are going to revolutionize everything. And in some ways they are. In other ways, it's like, okay, you can 3D print something, but it's still not better than you, you know, other methods of manufacture seen like 3D printed houses and stuff like that. So um, you can do some pretty amazing things with them, but I think they're still kind of finding their way into industry in general. Um, so, you know, five years, 10 years from now, I don't know. Maybe most of our pens will be 3D printed. I don't know, um, probably not, but I think it's, it's really uh, interesting to see the technology followed and see where it can go. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in general, the challenge you have with 3D printing, at least from what I understand of their current kind of state is you can't get, you know, really, really complex colors and patterns and stuff like that with 3D printing. It's pretty monotone. Um, and so that is just not generally as appealing in a pen version uh, than maybe some other things that you could do. So maybe it's just there's certain techniques or something that need to be developed or the technology needs to advance a little further to where they can do more decorative and elemental things with the 3D printed stuff. I don't know, right now it seems fairly utilitarian in terms of its use. Okay, uh, next question I have is from Molly's Mama 2010 on Instagram. What is your recommendation for an heirloom caliber pen? Something you can love and use and will stand the test of time. Um, you know, I think a lot of fountain pens would probably fall into this category to be quite honest. I think just the general classification of a fountain pen denotes a little bit more longevity and a little bit more quality than most of what you associate with, you know, kind of your throwaway disposable pens. Um, certainly it's not exclusive to fountain pens, but I think just in general, fountain pens as a category are made to last a little longer and will therefore be around uh, longer. 
than your average disposable pens. Certainly there are disposable fountain pens and stuff like that. That's not really what I'm talking about. You know, you have your lower price pens. I've got things like, you know, the Platinum Preppy. You know, these are $4, $5 pens. These are not disposable, but they're, they're not exactly like I'm gonna buy these and pass them on to my kids. Maybe I could, but that's probably not the intention of them. I wouldn't necessarily consider them heirloom. Um, but if I'm thinking, you know, an, another, sorry, another pen that I wanted to show too, you know, the Shark Pens or a Pilot Varsity, something like that. These are starter pens. These are made to kind of introduce you into the world of fountain pens. Um, not necessarily made to last you your entire lifetime and your children's lifetime. Um, but most of their fountain pens, especially if you're looking at something that probably $100 or more, I really think like if you're looking at gold nib pens, yeah, you're pretty much into like heirloom classification at that point. Of course, if you're like deep into fountain pens, you might be like, whatever, like a Lamy 2000, like that's not really an heirloom. I would certainly consider something like this to be an heirloom quality pen. Um, but again, it's probably gonna depend. There's no like official definition for what pens are heirloom and what aren't, um, you know. Probably, probably whatever whatever gets passed down through your family is the most meaningful. Even if it's a, a relatively inexpensive pen, if it's a pen and it still works, or it's a pen and somebody still has it, that would be considered an heirloom, right? Especially as we go further along into the era of technology and people don't even know what pens are necessarily, you know, 20 years, 40 years from now, they might be like, wow, look at this, you know, look at this heirloom, this Pilot G2. Can you believe that people used to scribble things down on paper? What a concept. They can't just read your mind and transcribe your, your inner thoughts and emotions. People actually had to write it with their hands. How primitive. <laughs> you know, there may be a time in the future where that is a reality. Or there'll be like this counterculture of people that, that scribble onto things, you know what I mean? And don't, can't just like telecommunicate with each other. Who knows? Um, <laughs> it took a weird turn. Uh, but anyway, so I would consider pens in that kind of like $100 and over range to really like kind of definitively be in that like heirloom range. Um, I think anything with like a gold palladium nib, you know, Visconti's, that type of thing. Um, nicer steel nibs too would be in that. You know, the nib doesn't necessarily have to denote the, the heirloomness of a pen. I think things like Edison, Herbert, you know, Montegrappa, Visconti, a lot of those steel nib pens, they're nicer pens. You know, they're going to last longer and stuff like that. So, um, or they'll, they'll, they'll be of the quality and of the design and character that would, you know, somebody would be willing to want to kind of keep it and pass it down. You know, it's kind of like part jewelry or part art and part pen as well. I think that, that kind of fits more into the, the heirloom thing as well. Um, certainly when you get into your really higher end stuff, you know, getting into like, I got Homo sapiens that I've been carrying around and beating the heck out of it. But, you know, this thing is going to last a long time and I'll pass it on to my kids once I, you know, once I, once, once they're of the age where they're not going to destroy it. Um, you know, and certainly nicer stuff, like you get into like the really nice, you know, Namikis and stuff where there's really, really kind of artistic. This is the uh, Yukari Moonlight, Nightline Moonlight. And um, so this one for sure, you know, it's made by an individual artist and it was, you know, something that um, I'm definitely gonna keep um, sacred in the family and pass that down. So that, that kind of stuff is obvious because it's very much artwork. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I think a lot of things that are like limited edition or themed pens um, would really fit into that kind of collectible or heirloom type thing. So um, I think there's room to debate about what actually makes it uh, heirloom or not, but that's how I would classify it. Cool. All right, Heather W on Facebook asks, I'm thinking of buying a metal Kaweco Sport and I would like to know your thoughts on the aluminum version versus the brass version. Okay, um, so I have a couple different aluminum versions here. I have the raw aluminum version, which is this like shiny kind of polished one. Um, and I got the rose gold because it's relatively new and I just haven't really talked about it much and I wanted to show it and it just looks pretty, pretty cool. So the rose gold is really nice. It's got this kind of like soft finish to them. A lot of the aluminum versions have this kind of soft, uh, um, you know, kind of like almost like a matte kind of finish. It doesn't feel textured, um, but it's just not like super bright and shiny necessarily kind of like the raw aluminum is. It's just very glaring, very shiny. Um, but this one's got a soft finish to it. Same with the red and the blues and the blacks and all the other ones. Um, but the rose gold is relatively new, so there it is. Looks beautiful. Um, these pens are going to be in like the $80 range. Um, the brass ones are a little bit more. I think they're more in the $100 range, and we actually don't have the brass one here. Um, so I haven't had a lot of experience with the brass sports specifically. Um, I don't daily carry a, a, an aluminum or brass, so I'm speaking a little bit more from just my experience kind of handling them, not so much 
using them, carrying them every day, if I gotta be honest. Um, but some of the biggest differences you're gonna see is just in the metals themselves. Of course, there's gonna be a big aesthetic difference. The brass is just brass. It's just yellow brass, like solid brass. There's no real coating to it. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna get banged up a little bit. It, it comes, you know, fairly polished, but it's gonna get scratched up, banged up, just kinda like the, the raw aluminum will, you know, over time as you toss it around. It's gonna get some fine scratches and stuff. Um, these ones are, are coated, uh, the colored ones, aluminum, so um, they're not gonna have, over time they might get kinda that stonewashed effect, where like certain parts of it might like chip off and all that, depending on how rough you handle it. Um, that could happen like over a long period of time to kind of break it in, wear it in. But I think part of the appeal of something like an aluminum or a brass pen is it's gonna gain some character over time, right? Like if you're carrying metal pens around, that's where you're really gonna see some of the, the benefit and the uniqueness of having a metal pen as opposed to uh, resin, right? So um, if you're carrying these around, it's gonna get some character to it. Aluminum is not really gonna patina much. Um, it might scratch up a little bit. You can ding it and scratch it and stuff and give it some character, but the brass is gonna patina a lot more. Um, just kind of like copper. Copper patinas even more. Brass, maybe not quite as much, but brass will get a little more character. It'll turn darker, like around the part where you're holding it more regularly and stuff like that. So that's part of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the brass is a little bit heavier just as a metal. So just carrying it around, especially if it's a pocket pen, you know, it has a clip, but the clip, you know, kind of attaches to the pen. So it's not like it's attached you know, it, it just slips onto there. So if you're like carrying it around outside of your whatever in a pocket or something like that, you know, the heavier the pen, the less the less it's gonna really wanna stay in one place um, as you're kind of just moving about the earth. Um, so the brass one is gonna, you're gonna just feel it a little bit more as you're carrying it around. If you're carrying it in your pocket, it's just gonna add a little bit of weight. It's gonna shift around, bang into your stuff, keys and whatnot. This will too, but um, it's just got a little bit of weight. Now it's a, it's a relatively small pen, so it's not quite as noticeable as something like, you know, some of the Keras Customs pens or other other brand pens, where you know they're much larger. There's a subst more substantial amount of metal, so the weight of the metal is is more varied on pens like those. You know, some of those like the um, like Keras Customs, for example, their um, brass pen was like twice the weight of the aluminum. Like it's it's a noticeable difference, um, and it's pretty noticeable too. I guess I guess by that math. Uh, if it's the exact same pen, it's twice the weight, probably about twice the weight here. I, I didn't scientifically look up like what's the weight of aluminum versus brass, um, but I know it's pretty substantial, uh, roughly twice. So um, you're going to have a pretty significant difference uh, in the weight of those two. So that's a lot of what you're going to see. A little bit of price difference, certainly an aesthetic difference, but um, the weight is going to be going to be the bigger thing. So they're they're both really nice. I think if you're you're deciding between the two, you know, obviously we don't have the brass, so I would say, hey, go for the aluminum because that's the one we carry, but really just whichever one you're happy with. Um, I think you could be either one and, and enjoy your, your pen, okay? All right, got a question from Mountain Cavalier on Instagram. Why don't more manufacturers offer clipless options? Clipless options, like I've been talking about the Quakos a lot this, uh, this one, this, whatever, this, this episode, <laughs> episode. Um, so we got, you know, the classic sports, we got the Procaio, I got the Jinhao Shark Pen, which has got a fin, but it's not really a clip. Um, you know, and there's other ones too that I'm trying to think about, like Banu doesn't have a clip. Um, trying to think off the top of my head. Most pens have clips. Um, and most people like pens with clips. Um, it's not exclusive, but I think some of it has to do with that's just what most people want and that's what most people buy. Um, you know, from talking with um, individuals like Brian Gray who does custom pens for Edison pens, um, you know, debating between clipless or non, or, or clipped. Uh, you know, a lot of people like the clip because there's an aesthetic to it. it. It looks very much like a pen when it has a clip on it. Uh, there can be a design component to having a clip on a pen. You can, you know, add different elements. You know, certainly something like a roll stop like this can add a design characteristic to Yoshi's pen. Um, and then uh, there's a functional aspect to it too. Obviously, it's called a clip because it clips on to stuff. So if you're carrying it around in your pocket or whatever, even a pen case, like it's gonna be, it's gonna clip in, it's gonna be more secure and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's a lot of the reason why people like it. Um, but also it acts as kind of a built-in roll stop. So not that you can't design other roll stop type mechanisms. You know, Coeco has hexagonal tops. So yeah, they don't need clips for the roll stopping um, feature because that's kind of built into the facets of the pen. Uh, whereas if you had a pen like this Edison um, and you, let me see if I can, Brian doesn't like it when I do this on camera, but 
oh, I can't quite get it. He really puts these on tight. But this is this is uh, threaded on here. You know, I got a Goulet grip. I'm like determined to get this thing out of here. I can talk through it, but basically you can unscrew this and you can remove the clip. I don't recommend doing this, so why in the world am I doing it on camera? Good question. I don't know. Maybe I've been working with my hands more and I just really like to break things. There we go. Just needed a little Goulet grip, get a little friction, so you can actually, you know, I don't recommend doing this often, and Brian <laughs> doesn't either. Um, but there you go. So I can take off the clip, uh, and I can make myself a clipless uh, Edison Nouveau Premier. <laughs> um, he doesn't like glue them in place or anything because if he ever wants to take them off, he does ratchet them on there pretty tight. Uh, but there you go. So I have a clipless Premier, but the thing is, if my desk is not perfectly level, it's going to roll and it might fall on the floor. So I think there's a functional aspect to, to there. And I think a lot of manufacturers maybe shy away from clipless, um, partly for that reason, um, for the, I don't know, call it liability aspect of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, so that's, that's one thing to take into consideration if you have a clipless pen, um, just having some design element to it. Uh, now I got to fix my pen. Let me see, get this thing on here. See, this is my own pen, so I can break it if, if I uh, mess around with the clip. I'm not afraid to break stuff. That's how you learn about these pens. There we go. You gotta align it because there's like a slot that the clip fits into and then get it in there. Boom. Looks beautiful. Uh, anyway, so don't do that at home, kids. So, um, yes, clipless stuff. I had actual notes about this. I've just been rambling. Um, yeah, there's some liability for the company that produces it. If the pen rolls off and breaks or something like that, people could get upset and then there's warranty stuff to deal with. Um, from my perspective, I think that there, you know, manufacturers certainly could do more clipless options. I think in general, it's not as universally appealing. So they're, they're hesitant to come out with a whole model of pen with no clip because it's going to be reducing quite a bit of who might be interested in that thing, unless maybe it's a... Um, limited edition type thing. Like we did a clipless version when we did our um, our, our Herbert pen, uh, which I have somewhere here. Yeah, so we did our Herbert Monument pen, um, of which I think we maybe have just a couple of these left. We came out with these back in November. Um, we wanted to really feature the material itself, this blue ribbon material, because it is Chet Herbert's, uh, his personal design for that. And we didn't want to interrupt it with a clip, you know, we thought it looked really cool. So we did a roll stop instead, or a pen rest, sorry. We did a pen rest instead. So, you know, that was an aesthetic choice on our part to do it that way. Um, so, it, again, manufacturers could do it. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to take this question was because I really wanted to get your feedback on this. If there are pens that you are super interested in, um, that you wish were clipless, or there are clipless pens out there, excuse me, out there that we're not aware of, that you absolutely love and why, you know, just kind of in general, how do you feel about clipless pens? Which are your favorite and why? Um, I would love to know that if you could post that down in the comments, that'll help a lot. And then we can give that feedback to manufacturers. And if it turns out there's this up, um, this upswell, upswell, un, un, underswell, <laughs> what word am I trying to think of? I don't know. Uh, it's hard to ramble in a video for like an hour by yourself. But if you're, <laughs> if there is a, a groundswell, maybe, maybe that's the word, of interest in clipless pens. Perhaps that's something that we could, you know, help to, to inspire and, and motivate manufacturers to come out with more of that stuff. Um, or we could seek it out more. I don't know, just a thought. Uh, and your feedback will help point us towards that. All right, some ink. Um, this is from New Watt Hissig, New Watt this Sig on Instagram. Um, I probably butchered that, I apologize. Uh, since cartridges are not labeled, what color cartridges come standard with most fountain pens? That's a great question. Um, it's going to vary from brand to brand, honestly. Um, a lot of brands like Lamy, for example, you know, the cartridge isn't labeled with the color. It's got the brand on it, but it's a proprietary cartridge. So, you know, it's Lamy ink and you can look at it and you can see that it's blue and they won blue ink. So, boom, it's Lamy blue. Um, you know, other brands, I think, tend to default more towards just black ink. You know, uh, with, with manufacturers that make their own pens and ink, think Lamy, Pilot, you know, Parker, um, you know, things that, that they have their own cartridges. 
uh, they're going to put their own cartridges in the pens. It, it makes sense, right? Um, and usually they're going to put black or blue. Maybe blue-black. Woo, if they get crazy. But generally they're going to go pretty standard because those are universally the most appealing colors. Or maybe most, I don't know. It's like vanilla ice cream. It's like it's not... It's not as many people's favorites, but it's something that is appealing to most everybody. Like a black and a blue is not going to blow anybody's mind, um, but they'll generally be like, okay, cool. Um, you know, companies that don't make their own cartridges, it's, it can sometimes be a total mystery into what ink is going to be in those cartridges because they're probably, probably buying those things in bulk. They know that they should include a cartridge with it, so they get something where it's generally going to be okay but they're not they're not putting their name on it they're not you know I mean they're including it with their pen but it's it's not like they're they're promoting that ink or standing behind it or they have their name you know if a pen has the if a pen company has their own ink that technically they've got their name behind it and all that but you know most of the time they're just including it I'm not gonna say it's an afterthought but it is kind of an afterthought you know it's like they're not pushing that ink necessarily it's not usually a selling point of the pen it's just something that kind of comes with the pen that you just think like, oh, okay, it's got a cartridge that checks the box. Um, and it's only certain, you know, people that actually ink it up and use it, and you're like, oh, I actually like this ink. What ink is this? And then you ask our, my team, and they're like, I don't know. You know, we ask the manufacturer, and they're like, no, we don't know. <laughs> or we ask the distributor or whatever. Um, you know, it's just the kind of thing that not ever, you know, it's not something that's like top of mind for everybody. So uh, in most people, most most people who are buying pens and cartridges come with them. I would say probably 80% of them don't even use the cartridges. They just kind of toss them or hang on to them and put them in a desk drawer for the next 40 years. Um, or they they might pop it in there and they don't really think too much about it one way or another. And they're like, oh, I might need more ink. Okay, I need a, a came with a black cartridge, so give me a black ink or whatever. So it's 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 actually very very seldom that we get asked, you know, specifically like which ink came in which cartridge. And we always try to put that information when we can find it out, but a lot of times manufacturers buy it in bulk. They don't even necessarily know exactly what color it is. You know, it may it may shock you to know that, you know, uh, there are there are companies out there that make ink for other companies, and you know it's kind of like. Uh, you know, companies that make shoes and clothes and electronics and stuff like that. You know, there's manufacturers of that stuff, but not every brand has its own entire vertical manufacturing distribution line. So I would imagine, especially for the the non-proprietary cartridges um, or, or pen brands that that use non that use non-proprietary cartridges, um, they're probably sourcing it out from some manufacturer, and there may be one manufacturer that's making cartridges that go in a hundred different pen brands. So Whose, whose ink is that actually? You know, it's going to be unnamed black ink from, you know, a manufacturer in Slovenia. You know, Slovenia is where a lot of ink cartridges come from, um, even from major brands. Um, they're always kind of mysterious about, like, who actually makes it and all that kind of stuff. But I know that Slovenia is, like, ink cartridge capital of the world. So, um, you know, probably it's coming from there uh, if it's uh, kind of a nondescript cartridge. And who knows exactly what formula of ink it even is or whose brand it is or anything like that. So a lot of times we just don't have an answer, but we will try and find out. So if you are curious, you're using one and you have any questions about like, hey, you know, I bought a whatever. I think we got a question this past week about Diplomat. It's like, hey, I bought a Diplomat pen. It had a Diplomat cartridge in it. You know, that that those Diplomat cartridges are not something that's even brought into the U.S., but it's like, yes, they do technically make it. Um, so we'll like, okay, well, well, we don't have access to that but at this moment, but, you know, we'll try and find an alternative or something like that. And, um, so we'll always try to find that out and, you know, if we'll put it on the product page or we'll put it in the Q&A, you know, not this Q&A, but the, the Q&A on our website. Um, so we'll do our best to try and figure that out for you if you, uh, if you ask. So there you go, a little bit of insight into the process there. Um, and I'll close out this week with a personal question. This is from Shiloh M. on Facebook. Uh, what do you guys think about the Goulet Nation and all the shenanigans that we get up to? What are the things that have really surprised you about this mob? Okay, so uh, Goulet Nation is our Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group, but, you know, it doesn't cost anything to get in there. As long as you have a Facebook account, uh, and you get, in, you know, just ask to get invited and, or ask to get in and whatever, and somebody will let you in. So that's it's not hard to get in there. Um, but it's a really, really great group, I got to say. Like, we set it up uh, a little over a year ago, and, um, you know, it's the Internet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you never really know what's going to happen. Uh, it's a very passionate group, like very passionate group um, and very fertile soil being a combination of a very passionate group 
on the internet. Um, so it's, it's fertile soil for drama, uh, but also magic at the same time. And I would have to say with this group, Gilead Nation, um, there's way more magic than drama, right? Uh, and we kind of set that up when we initially set the group. We were like, look, we do not want this to devolve into just this kind of cesspool of pens on the internet. We, we want to keep it, you know, we, we're not going to like police it every day necessarily, but we want this, we want to kind of set this as like, hey, look, let's keep this positive. You know, we're a pretty positive bunch around here uh, at Gilead Pens. It's like, we want to keep it positive and, and uplifting and that kind of stuff. And so we kind of set that out in the original stuff. And there was some some kind of just like bumping up against that a little bit, especially in the beginning. And there's people that bump up against it every now and then, you know, posting stuff. You know, even if it's like not starting out really, uh, really in a negative place, but sometimes, you know, the comments can just really go quickly and stuff can devolve and it's like, shut it down. We eliminate the thread and get it out of there. Um, you know, and we have mechanisms in place where people can, you know, flag things and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, if we, if we come in one morning and there's like 20 people that have flagged a certain thread and we're like, we read it and we're like, Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of taking a turn. Um, and so we'll just kind of like, okay, we'll sunset that one. Um, there's lots of other conversation people can have. Um, so anyway, uh, I was, I think I was surprised, um, you know, just how, how positive. So anyway, just after talking about all that, um, it's really not, not all that often in the grand scheme of things that that actually happens. There's way more just positivity and encouragement and just, just optimism that happens in this group. I think, you know, that's kind of what we set out for the group, but I think I've even been surprised how much of that is actually just th flourishing and thriving and how much people have really grabbed onto that. And, um, to the point where they're like, I need to leave this group because I'm spending too much time on it. And it's, it's such a great place to be, but I'm spending too much on pens and I need to get out of this, you know, the, so they, the few of the things that have happened in there that have really surprised me. Um, the group created their own name. They call themselves the Penablers. Uh, that is not a term that we came up with uh, at Gilead Pens, but it's a name that the group came up with, um, you know, relatively quickly too. Um, and they, they created their own kind of sports style logo. Uh, so that was pretty awesome. And, and, you know, as soon as they created the logo, you know, the, the individual that created the logo gave it to us, messaged us and said, hey, I created this logo. Everybody thought it was really cool. Um, you know, here you go. It's a gift. And we we're like, okay, that's cool. So we like put it on some Teespring swag and you know, message everybody and we're like, hey, look, here's some stuff. If you want to you know, get a shirt or get a mug or something like that with your logo, have fun, you know? And so they have. So I've literally like gone to meetups in places where people have been wearing the penabler you know, swag. And I was like, that's kind of awesome. So very pleasant surprise. Was not anticipating that at all, but it is pretty rad. Um, you know, I was really, really heartwarmed when there was a member, this happened last year, um, when, a, when a member of the group lost their home in, some Cal in a California wildfire. And they lost everything, lost their whole pen collection and all that kind of stuff. That was the context of, of how it came up. And they were like, I lost my whole pen collection because I lost everything. Um, and the group actually rallied together. They like found out what they really, you know, wanted and all that kind of stuff and, and had. And, and they all like bought stuff and sent things they had. And they actually mailed just a slew of pens and stuff, ink and all that, to this individual and their family. Um, so they could kind of get back on their feet, at least pen wise. Um, so that was just like, wow, like, you know, groundswell of support. Um, so it was pretty rad. Um, the group has created their own bingo cards for, you know, we do the handwritten thank you cards um, for members of our team. Um, so they created a bingo card based on the people's name because we have, you know, the names of our folks on our site and their bios and stuff like that. Um, so they, they actually created a bingo card based on who's on the team and so they're like collecting cards and they place their orders. Did not expect that. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff about like people showing their collections, their wish lists and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, just fun stuff like that that comes up all the time that I probably kind of did expect. But, um, you know, the most surprising thing I think overall is just really how genuinely kind that everyone is. There's just little things here and there that come up, but um, it's really kind of become and what everybody, you know, proclaims. It's kind of like a safe haven of the Internet or a safe haven in the pen world, at least um, for a lot of folks. And it's a place where they actually gain a lot of positivity and encouragement there. So that, that's pretty rad. Um, a lot of members have talked about the fact that it's like they only have a Facebook account because of that group, you know, because they just, they don't like most of everything else that's happening on Facebook. Um, very politically driven, often very negative and all that kind of stuff. Very, you know, bipartisan and, or sorry, very, very partisan and, and not very like collaborative and, and, um, and that this group is not like that at all. So that's, that's kind of cool to see 
uh, something that we have, you know, really kind of set as a vision and, and, and cultivated a little bit, but really it's the community as a whole that has gathered together to make that happen. So it's really kind of cool just to see just kindness, generosity in the pen world um, really playing out in this community. Um, and Gulli Nation demonstrates that really well. So, you know, we're going to keep it going as long as, the, as long as we can serve in that way and, and provide for that. We're, we're very happy about that. So who knows what, how long it's going to last because, you know, it is on Facebook. We don't control that. But um, at least for now, it seems to be a great place where that's happening. Cool. All right, that's what all I got for you this week. I have a hypothetical question for you this week. Not even pen related, so we'll make it a little fun. I don't know if I've asked this before, but it's one of my one of my my more interesting hypothetical questions, which I credit Drew to coming up with. Um, if you could have a tree in your yard that could grow any one single meal that you couldn't sell, it's just for you to eat, your family, and all that kind of stuff. What would it grow? And it could be anything. It could be like you know whatever, Ruth's Chris steak dinner or something like that. And it just it grows like full plates of you know you know buttery ribeye or something like that. Um, you know, for me, it's funny. I was like, you know, I like Chipotle and I can, I'm a fan. I can almost never have too much of it. I love Chick-fil-A chicken sandwiches and I love, uh, Chipotle burrito bowls. Um, so the Chipotle burrito bowl is kind of up there cause it's nice, kind of healthy, kind of balanced, uh, meal there. But actually one of my favorite single foods is apples. Uh, I eat apples pretty much every day. And, uh, it is kind of ironic cause when I'm thinking like, I could have a tree that would grow anything in my yard, it would be apples. An apple tree? Like, those exist. I could make that happen. This isn't even a hypothetical. <laughs> but I don't have an apple tree in my yard, so go figure. So anyway, I'm curious to know what you would have grow in your yard. Make that the, the, the question of the week for this week. Go ahead and leave it in the comments. I also want to know about the clipless pens thing. So um, you can make that more of the kind of official question of the week if you, if you don't deem this one actually worthy. Anyway, I hope you have a great weekend, great rest of your week. You can check out a lot of what I talked about here on GooleyPens.com. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you have not already. Thanks so much for watching and right on.